Welcome to The Backstory with Dr. Ricky Singh. This podcast is focused on bringing you the latest research-based information about dramatically improving health, well-being, and quality of life. And here's your host, Dr. Ricky Singh. Hey guys, welcome to The Backstory. And today I want to talk about something that I not only see a lot in my office, but it's actually something that I've been dealing with the past few weeks. And hopefully by the time this airs, I am cured or on my way to recovery. But honestly, it's been a really tough couple of weeks and I've been suffering with something called myofascial pain syndrome or muscle knots or muscle spasms. And I see a lot of patients suffer with this condition. And truth be told, it has made me a lot more empathetic that I'm actually in your shoes. I know what it feels like. I know how much it impacts your life, your mood your ability to function and interact with your family and friends. So I decided to share my thoughts on myofascial pain and what we commonly refer to as muscle knots, muscle spasms, trigger points, all of these things. So what is myofascial pain? Myofascial pain is a pain disorder, essentially characterized by muscle knots or trigger points, areas that are hyper irritable and really sensitive area of the muscles that tend to tighten or spasm even when you're at rest. And oftentimes when you apply pressure to these tender areas of the muscles, they refer pain to other parts of the body. The most common areas where patients experience myofascial pain are the upper back, the neck, shoulder region, sometimes in the lower back. And when you have a muscle spasm or one of these trigger points, Again, especially in the upper back, it can often refer to other areas like the rib cage, which is actually what I've been dealing with the past few weeks. Even at the time of this recording, I have a pretty tight muscle on my right side in my mid back, kind of in between my shoulder blade and my spine. And it's made simple things like breathing really difficult or bending forward and picking up my two year old very challenging, putting my clothes on or even reaching overhead and tying my turban. All reasons why I thought it's important to share this message of myofascial pain because I feel for you out there if you suffer from this condition. And why these muscle knots or myofascial pain occur is due to a variety of reasons. It could be from being relatively sedentary or having poor posture, uh, maybe overusing your muscles or injuring muscles, sometimes even things like dehydration or unhealthy eating habits can cause muscle spasms. And very commonly, something that I see in my office is stress and anxiety being the source and the reason for these to occur. One of the common characteristics of myofascial pain are trigger points. And basically a trigger point occurs when there is something called a local twitch response. What happens is when you press on that tender point or that palpable nodule or tender spot in the muscle, what you might see is a really quick firing of the muscle or a quick contraction. And that confirms the presence of one of these trigger points. We often see that a lot in clinic when we use our thumbs to press on a muscle or even when I do a trigger point injection, I can see that muscle twitch and fire, which tells me this is the presence of one of those trigger points. But the problem is, is that there's no real great laboratory test or imaging finding or MRI or ultrasound to identify or diagnose myofascial pain. So really we rely on physical exam and more important, your history, you telling us where the pain is, why it's there, when it occurs to help us elucidate the etiology and diagnose you with myofascial pain. So let's talk a little bit about the theories of why myofascial pain or trigger points occur in the first place. The first hypothesis is something called the Cinderella fiber hypothesis. And basically this was first proposed in 1990 and it discussed that muscles tend to activate at a low level of static exertion. So imagine you're continuously putting the same muscles in the same position repeatedly over and over and over again, and that muscle is gonna get damaged and overloaded like Cinderella. This happens commonly in office workers sitting at a computer, sustained posture, looking at the screen, using the mouse. We see a lot of musicians holding sustained positions with their instrument. Hairdressers are common patients, dentists who are kind of hunched over and examining the mouth. So no one is really immune to getting these myofascial pain or trigger points. And in order to show support of this Cinderella fiber hypothesis, there was a study done where 
some office workers were put through some of these low level kinds of continuous muscle contractions. And those that were, were much more likely to develop myofascial trigger points. On the other hand, critics of this theory say that it really fails to explain the exact origin and why these low level threshold fibers get fatigued and become metabolically exhausted to begin with. So a more widely accepted hypothesis or theory is that these trigger points develop because of some initiating event. And I believe this hypothesis and this is what I use to diagnose and treat patients. And what happens is that all of our muscles release a chemical called acetylcholine, which causes the muscles to tense and contract. And when muscles are tensed up and when they are contracted, they restrict blood flow to the area, which makes sense, right? When you contract your muscle, you're kind of closing all those small blood vessels in the area, which restrict blood flow. And when blood flow is restricted, there is insufficient ATP. ATP is a chemical that circulates in our body and it provides us with energy. You've probably seen someone or heard of someone taking creatine, right? When you work out, you take creatine to give you energy, which is something that increases ATP in the body, theoretically. You've also heard of something called rigor mortis, right? When you die, your body tenses up and the body gets stuck in a pretty contracted position. And the reason for that is that there's no longer any circulating ATB and your body is unable to relax that muscle. So without getting too scientific about it, your body and your muscles use calcium to cause a muscle contraction. And it's the ATP that's required to pump that calcium out of the muscle in order to relax it. So if there's no ATP in the muscle, the muscle stays contracted. And if that happens in a sustained fashion over and over and over, you get a negative feedback loop, which causes that muscle to remain contracted. And if that goes on long enough, then your body starts releasing other neuroreactive substances like serotonin and substance P, which can sensitize the tissues and effectively cause pain. So the bottom line is, and the accepted hypothesis of myofascial pain and trigger points, is that if you're doing something to overuse the muscles, even in some type of low level function, it can cause your muscles or your very, very small muscles to overwork and fire repeatedly, ending up with myofascial pain. You can't really have a conversation about trigger points or myofascial pain without talking about Dr. Janet Travell, who's kind of the godmother of myofascial pain. So Dr. Travell was born and raised in New York. She actually worked at Cornell Medical, which was part of New York Hospital back in the 1950s and 60s. And basically, she determined that in order for something to be called myofascial pain syndrome or trigger point, it must exhibit four features. So first, there must be a palpable nodule or a band that's hard in the muscle. Number two, that band has to be extremely tender and extremely sensitive. Number three, if you press on that band, there should be a reproduction of pain that's distant to the spot, right? Something, it's referred pain somewhere else. And number four, there should be relief of pain if you massage that area or if you perform an injection. And what's interesting about Dr. Janet Travell was that she was the personal physician of, at then, Senator John F. Kennedy, who of course became president of the United States. She became the first woman to ever hold the post of White House physician. And John F. Kennedy actually described her as a medical genius. She was one of the people who helped restore his function when he walked in with crutches and back pain. He used to walk out of her treatments upright, feeling fantastic. So Dr. Travell teamed up with other physicians to explore the etiology and the realm of trigger points. And in 1990s, she published her book called Myofascial Pain and the Trigger Point Manual, which was kind of a breakthrough at that time. And it's really changed our understanding and treatment approach towards not just trigger points, but chronic pain in general. So how do you treat myofascial pain and trigger points? And I'll talk about things that I've done in the past couple of weeks. So one of the more common treatments popularized by Dr. Janet Travell is something called spray and stretch technique. And basically this is a technique where you use a vapo coolant spray. And if you've been to my office or you've had an injection somewhere, you've probably had the physician use this cooling spray called ethyl chloride, which kind of numbs the skin prior to the injection. But for the purposes of myofascial pain, you spray the skin overlying the trigger point which anesthetizes it or numbs it up along the entire length of the muscle and immediately after you apply pressure to the muscle 
to cause a stretch. Uh, you repeat this a few times, allowing that muscle to experience a full range of motion. And after that, you apply heat or even moist heat to increase blood flow, bringing oxygen and nutrients to that muscle area. So that's called the spray and stretch technique. Another common technique is massage therapy, right? Massage therapy is beneficial to treat muscles. And we had a massage therapist on the podcast last year who basically discussed different techniques on improving circulation and blood flow. And one of the more common techniques that we see in massage therapy is known as Swedish massage. This is what I like and helps my back and leg situation. Basically, Swedish massage implements long strokes, kneading, circling movements, sometimes vibration and tapping. All these things really help in relaxing the muscle. On the other hand, deep tissue massage, which is not something that I really enjoy, it targets the deep layers of the fascia and the deep layers of the muscle and connective tissue that can help release chronic tension. I tend to be a little bit on the sensitive side, whereas my wife and mom and father-in-law really, really love deep tissue massage. Sports massage and Thai massage can also be used because they rely on stretching, which is another great option to release some of that tension in the muscle. And there's always the question about heat versus cold therapy. You know, patients often wonder, should I use ice for this? Should I use heat for this? Not really knowing when to apply heat or ice, and it can be very tricky. But what about using both together? And this is something called contrast therapy, where you're effectively alternating between hot and cold, both ice and heat, and both have their uses when treating injuries, especially muscle pain. The benefits of ice or cold therapy, also known as cryotherapy, is effective because it causes blood flow constriction. It narrows the blood vessels, it reduces inflammation, it suppresses pain signals, all things that are beneficial when you're in an acute pain episode. Whereas heat kind of works in the opposite manner because it's a vasodilator, it brings blood flow, it improves circulation, it brings oxygen and nutrients, which can also help reduce pain and loosen cramping and aching muscles. But the general rule is to apply ice initially to reduce the swelling, and once that swelling and severe tenderness have reduced, then you can start implementing heat. And while there are several different methods of utilizing contrast therapy, I think broadly speaking, the best way to apply this is in five minute intervals. So first using a cooling pack or a pack of frozen vegetables, applying that to the tender area over a t-shirt or a towel because you can get cold burns just like you can get heat burns. And after five minutes, then switching over to a heat pack or a moist, warm towel and doing the same thing for five minutes and repeating that a few times for a total of 30 minutes, trying this a couple of times a day. And that's known as contrast therapy. What about topical creams and ointments? Patients often ask me about muscle rubs. And I think there is some local benefit in using things like Icy Hot and Asper Cream, which mostly contain menthol or capsaicin. You know, there's very little systemic absorption, which is also great because there's low interaction with other medications you might be taking, and it can definitely provide some symptomatic relief. Anti-inflammatory creams such as Voltaren or Diclofenac, Salon pauses over the counter, or even some of these CBD salves can help distract some of the pain fibers, which can allow you to engage in some of those stretching. So... Treating muscle knots or myofascial pain definitely takes time. And as I stated before, it's taken me about three weeks to get this under control. I'm not pain-free yet, but I have incorporated massage, contrast therapies, anti-inflammatories. All these things have helped me get to where I am right now. And when I look back and think about the cause, I think it all started with me being really passionate and aggressive about my marathon training. I was running very regularly and increasing my weekly mileage. But honestly, I was not supplementing that with the requisite strengthening and the stretching in between that I definitely should have done. So admittedly, I've been a pretty bad patient. So I needed to take a break from running, which I have done the last 10 days. I've also taken a break from golf, which you may know is very difficult for me, but that was necessary, especially in relation to where my pain was located, which was in my right shoulder blade area. I slept on a hard surface, I used ice packs and heating pads, I've been doing yoga pretty regularly, and I have to say I'm in a much better position today than I was two weeks ago. I'm not out of the woods yet, but I am optimistic that I'm going in the right direction. And that leads me to stretching. I don't think we tend to hold a stretch long enough to achieve 
change in the fascia of a tendon or fascia of the muscle. So I started to hold my stretches for 30 to 60 seconds, and I've noticed that by holding it and sustaining that stretch for that long, you really begin to experience a relaxation in the muscle and decreased tension, helping the muscle spasms and these trigger points eventually approve. So I wish you all success in treating your muscle pain and muscle knots. I hope you live your fullest, most functionally mobile lives. I leave you with this quote, the pain you feel today will be the strength you feel tomorrow. So until next time, this is The Backstory and we've got your back. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Backstory. Please subscribe, rate the podcast, and review The Backstory on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Play Music. And feel free to share this podcast on social media or even your own website or blog. This podcast is for general information purposes only. It does not constitute the practice of medicine, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information is at the user's own risk. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice. To learn more about Dr. Singh and his clinical research, please follow him on social media. You can also sign up for his newsletter by going to www.rickysinghmd.com. That's R-I-C-K-Y-S-I-N-G-H-M-D dot com.